Good morning, Bethany North. Pastor Raul here. Good to be with you. Happy Advent, second Sunday of Advent. I'm excited because we get to light yet another candle. This week is the candle of joy. Joy all throughout scripture is attributed to those who chase after God. Joy is the antidote to despair. And so we see that uh, uh, that joy is not something that is earned, but it's a gift. It's a gift given by the Holy Spirit to those who pursue God's goodness with just tenacity. It is their, it is their goal to know God. And God sends his spirit and gifts joy to those who are following after him. So today, know that if you're following after God, your name may be joy. He may name you Joy. So let's hear uh, our Advent reading from the Chen family and consider uh, the gifts that God has to give. Hi everyone, we're the Chuns. I'm Christina, this is Deacon, Ashlyn, and Jordan. Today we'll be reading from Isaiah 35. The desert and the dry ground will be glad. The dry places will be full of joy. Flowers will grow there like the first crocus in the spring. The desert will bloom with flowers. It will be very glad and shout for joy. The glorious beauty of Lebanon will be given to it. It will be as beautiful as the rich lands of Carmel and Sharon. Everyone will see the glory of the Lord. They will see the beauty of our God. Strengthen the hands of those who are weak. Help those whose knees give way. Say to those whose hearts are afraid, be strong and do not fear, your God will come. He will pay your enemies back. He will come to save you. Then the eyes of those who are blind will be opened. The ears of those who can't hear will be unplugged. Those who can't walk will leap like a deer and those who can't speak will shout for joy. Water will pour out in dry places. Streams will flow in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool of water. The thirsty ground will become bubbling springs. In the places where wild dogs once lay down, tall grass and papyrus will grow. A wide road will go through the land. It will be called the way of holiness. Only those who lead a holy life can use it. Unclean and foolish people can't walk on it. No lions will use it. No hungry wild animals will be on it. None of them will be there. Only people who have been set free will walk on it. Those the Lord has saved will return to their land. They will sing as they enter the city of Zion. Joy that lasts forever will be like beautiful crowns on their heads. They will be filled with gladness and joy. Sorrow and sighing will be gone. Stay healthy and safe. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you, Chun family, for that reading. We're going to light our second candle now. This is this first one, remember, is the candle of hope. And now we are going to light the candle of joy. Drive away 
Over. 
in our hearts and in our minds. We make room for you. Come and fill our spaces. to see you, help us to, to know you more, to experience you in a deeper way, to worship you more fully this season. Allow us to stop and make room and make space for you, God. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, friends. My name is Jordan, and I'm the director of children's ministry. So recently, a friend of mine gave me a plant, and not just any plant. It's a plant that she actually grew herself from a bigger plant she already had. How cool is that, right? And it got me thinking about plants um, and all the different things it takes for plants to grow. What are some of those things? Why don't you turn to whoever you're sitting with right now and share some answers? I'll wait for you. Now, I couldn't hear any of the answers you gave, but I imagine you said things like soil and water and sunlight, right? Well, did you know that there's something else that plants need to be able to grow? Any ideas? It's time. It takes time for plants to grow. You can't just take a seed, put it in the ground, put some water over it, and expect to come back the next day to a giant tree. It takes time for something like that to grow. And especially when you're growing plants from seeds, because you put them in the dirt and cover them, and you can't actually see if they're growing at all or not. You just have to wait patiently and trust that the sunlight and soil and water are all working together to grow and change that seed into a beautiful plant, or trees, flowers, all of the plants that we see around us. So you have to have faith and be patient. And it's like that with God, too. We can't always see what God is doing in the world around us, but we can trust and have faith that God is working to grow and change the world around us all the time, even when we can't see it. Just like that seed under the dirt that's growing, even when we can't see it. And that's not just what God is like, but that's kind of like what this season of Advent is like too. We have to trust that God is at work and that there is a savior who changes everything, even if we don't immediately see that. So, Who is this savior that changes everything, this savior that we celebrate at Advent every year? You'll just have to wait and hear that good news later this month. In the meantime, though, we have Bible story videos and activities that you can do at home. And you can also join us for our kids' Zoom churches Sunday mornings. If you're watching this on our website, there's a family ministry button below your screen where you can get the links to all of these things. You can also find them on our website and in our weekly family ministry newsletter. See you next time. Let's hear now today's reading from Matthew 2, verses 1 through 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The word of the Lord. 
Hello, Bethany North. What an honor to be with you this morning. If you don't know who I am, my name is Ali Quatier, and I'm the worship director here at Bethany. And if you do know me, you'll notice that I don't have a big red keyboard standing in front of me. Uh, I get to be with you all in a new capacity this morning in one of the most tender and sacred seasons of the church calendar year. The anticipation we feel in Advent is one of my favorite things. But friends, we have done so much waiting this year. If you've been following along in the Advent devotional, it expresses our current moment so well. We've been waiting for traveling plans to get rearranged or canceled, waiting for information about school, about graduations or weddings or funerals, waiting to know if we still have jobs to return to, waiting to hear about the health and well-being of our family members or loved ones. 2020 has tested our waiting like nothing else. And yet here I am asking you to enter in with me and make just a little more room in your heart to watch and to wait. This story is for all of us and requires such tremendous courage to keep going. Why don't we pray together as we begin? (sighs) Father, you have called us uh, into another Advent season where we remember the wild story that you have so creatively woven together. Uh, In these short moments that we have together, will will your spirit be present? May may our eyes be open to what your scriptures have to teach us this morning. May our hearts be willing to respond. We offer ourselves to you in your good grace. Amen. Last week, Scott took us through the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew does a fabulous job of showing the significance of Jesus coming from the line of David. A broken family line would usher in the Messiah, fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. And this week, in our very short text, we are introduced to the Magi who go and worship Jesus, the King. Throughout the Old Testament, we have heard promises and prophecies of the redemption of God's people and of a future kingdom. I want, I want to read some of those for us. God's promise to Abraham was, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. Numbers twenty four seventeen says, a star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. The prophet Micah says, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over all of Israel. The prophet Isaiah in chapter nine says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And then later we hear in Isaiah 60, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, the darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears to you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. These passages are dreams of a new kingdom. The Israelites had failed and needed a new king, and God and his faithfulness hadn't forgotten his covenant of love. But what's striking about these images of lights and stars and kingdoms is that instead of a city being rebuilt and glorified, the gospel writer storytelling moves this light over a manger in Bethlehem. This is a huge transition. I like the way Dr. Kenneth Bailey reflected on this when he reframed these passages a little bit. He said, around the child, there was great light and the glory of the Lord appeared. Shepherds visited the child, not the city. The great hopes for the city were transferred to a child in a manger. Indeed, the glory of the Lord shone round about the child. And who are the ones to announce this transition? The Magi. The Magi came to a child, not a city, with their gifts and worship. But who are these Magi? Where did they come from? From what we know historically, the Magi were from the east, most likely Arabia. They were highly educated astrologers or sorcerers of sorts. 
They were highly esteemed in their culture as advisors to kings, but probably didn't have much credibility in the Jewish community, and certainly not respected by the followers of God. But even with their lack of credibility, they probably knew these prophecies after hundreds of years of hearing them proclaimed. And when they saw the star, they knew it was significant and it was time to go and see. There are two things I believe the Magi have to teach us today, and it surrounds their willingness to move from passive observation to participation and their decision to follow and worship. And so the first idea I wanna reflect on a little bit is that this participation includes everyone. Matthew is the most Jewish of the gospel writers and works to show again and again this fulfillment and unity of the Old Testament prophecies. And what an interesting choice these Magi were outsiders in this story. They knew the foretellings of a coming Messiah, but follow, were followers of a pagan religion. But this doesn't mean that they weren't also searching for truth. All of humanity has this unifying desire. We are constantly looking for truth. We live in a broken world and are yearning for redemption and healing. Our bodies crave it. The Magi saw the star, and because of their knowledge of the stars and having understood these prophecies, they knew what to look for. Could this be the truth that they had been searching for? Was this the king of the Jews? Was this the savior the prophets had spoken about? So just when we thought the first visitors after Jesus' birth would be someone in the inner circle, instead it was an outsider. Gentiles were included in the birth narrative. I believe this is a powerful foreshadowing of what would come because Jesus would soon teach that the way of Christ the Messiah is sitting at the table with the outsiders. It is the least of these who will inherit the kingdom. It is a child resting in a manger that would be the savior of the world. All of our understandings of kingdoms and power and being an insider are turned upside down. I remember when I first heard about this upside down kingdom concept for the very first time as a college student. I knew stories of Jesus sitting with the stranger, the leper, the woman at the well, but I hadn't fully comprehended that the whole of the gospel story could be and was brought forth through the participation of unlikely people, outsiders. That understanding changed the whole trajectory of my faith as it was no longer about being the right kind of person, but instead a willing participant in the unfolding of the story, a story that is meant for everyone, including you. These mysterious visitors became powerful tools used by God. This gave me pause this week. As a Christ follower, I'd like to think I have this story down. I've got this, I understand it, I know exactly what to do. But I think this story encourages us to reflect on the people in our lives who may be on the outside. Maybe they're skeptics or doubters. Maybe they have a different political ideology than you do. Maybe their life experience has led them to different conclusions about who Jesus is. Maybe this morning you feel like an outsider, unseen, and are wondering if your participation matters. The answer is yes. The creative way God has historically woven so many unlikely people into this story of hope is a poignant reminder of the expansiveness of the gospel. He is on a mission drawing all people unto himself, even those we least expect, and everyone is invited to respond. And our second idea this morning is that the Magi model for us what this response and participation can look like. I was both fascinated and delighted that their response after seeing the star was to humbly go and worship. Instead of the Israelites or other Jewish communities who had waited for literally hundreds of years to see the Messiah, it's a group of pagan astrologers who saw the star and knew to respond. The Magi had to ask a question when they arrived to Jerusalem. Wait, where is this king who has been born king of the Jews? Nobody else even saw or recognized the star, but the Magi dared to be seen as crazy because they believed the promise. Their curiosity moved them from passive observation to active participation in their pursuit of knowing and knowing God. As they traveled hundreds of miles to meet Jesus, I'm sure there were countless moments when they wondered if the journey was worth it. I want to remind you this morning that that journey is worth it. Following Christ the Messiah is worth it. 
Our pursuit and our worship is worth it. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, If you seek me, you will find me, if you seek me with all your heart. We are called as the people of God to seek, to stay curious, and to bravely pursue and worship against all odds. These unassuming wise men remind us to keep our eyes open because the promise of the gospel is still bursting forth. This wasn't just a one-time occurrence over 2,000 years ago. We are still in the middle of this story and have the chance to step in. But I also recognize that we are in the middle of a global pandemic. We have seen and experienced countless moments of injustice, racism, death, suffering, and loss this year. The waiting has felt acute. But friends, now more than ever, we must lean in and trust the 4,000-year history of God's faithfulness. This is a story that should compel us to live differently even when we are discouraged or don't know what's going to happen. Are we, like the Magi, willing to risk being those unlikely people God uses to spread the good news? And so in closing, I wanted to invite us to take a couple of minutes in a time of prayer. And then we're going to worship because I think the Magi got it right there. Their journey culminated in worship of the Savior. But listen to Isaiah 60, one through two, one more time. Arise, shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See Darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears to you. This is the God the Magi were searching for, the Messiah whose light pierces the darkness and whose glory appears. This Savior is worthy of our worship. And I don't just say that as a worship director, but I say that as someone who believes that when we worship, our hearts are softened and moldable, When we worship, our fear dissipates. When we worship, our bodies are realigned both to who God is and who we are as children of God. And when we worship, our truest calling is renewed, a calling to bravely step into the story and be people who embody hope. So whether you are feeling hopeful or are completely worn out this morning, join me in saying yes to the pursuit of Christ this Advent because the journey of waiting and following and worshiping Christ the Messiah is worth it. I'm going to to lead us in a short time uh, of prayer before we begin singing again. And so, and we're gonna ask some questions. Uh, Where might God be calling you to participate in this story in a new way, maybe in this Advent season? So let's pray together. Oh God, we take these moments now to admit the ways we have resisted your call to follow. We recognize the moments we have doubted, questioned, or have simply been too weary to keep our eyes open and fixed on the hope that this Advent invites us into. So in the safety of your compassion and grace, we place before you now all the things we are carrying in this season or perhaps the things that are preventing us from fully stepping into your story. Father, in this era of unknowing and uncertainty and change, we want to embody the faith of the Magi, bravely seeking you and offering ourselves to you. So in your mercy, will you remind us this morning of the work that is unfolding all around us? Will you bring to mind even now opportunities for us to participate in this grand story? And more than anything, Jesus, we reclaim our identity as your beloved. May we remember your reckless and powerful love, a love that will sustain us in this waiting and a love that will empower us, encourage us, and lead us forward. We worship you, Jesus. Amen. Every task is unto him. Every that
It was good to be with you this morning, and I know that we have challenging days ahead. This Advent is so disorienting, and we don't know what's around the corner, but I want to encourage you this morning to keep going, to keep pursuing Christ, and I want to leave you with these words from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. It says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor, your watching, your waiting, your following, and your worshiping the Lord is never in vain. 
Love you so much. We'll see you next week. <laughs>